Good afternoon. Good afternoon, and thank you all for joining us. I'm delighted to welcome Tom Siebel as today's speaker in our first View from the Top presentation of the spring semester. This speaker series gives the college community a chance to hear from leading thinkers in technology and business innovation. I'd like to thank our co-sponsors for today's lecture, the Student Association of the Center for Entrepreneurship and Technology, CET. These students are turning new ideas into real companies and proving that the entrepreneurial spirit is alive and well at Cal. We are proud to have them partnering with us today. Where are they? They are in the back, so thank you. Before I introduce Tom Siebel, I invite you to mark your calendars for additional special events coming to the college this spring. For example, our next View from the Top lecture will be Tuesday, March 4th, and will feature an innovative education leader, Dr. Richard Miller, the president of Olin College in uh, Massachusetts. He'll describe his vision for transforming engineering education with an emphasis on hands-on learning. For more details about our upcoming programs, please see our Save the Date card or visit our website, coe.berkeley.edu. Welcome, Bob. So too. <laughs> and now it's my great honor to introduce today's speaker, Tom Siebel. Tom's achievements as a technology innovator, business leader, and philanthropist make him an outstanding choice for our View from the Top lecture series. Tom is an exceptional example of what engineering skills can accomplish when they're combined with business acumen and civic engagement. Tom Siebel is a graduate of the University of Illinois, where he earned a bachelor's degree in history, an MBA, and a master's in computer science. He is a frequent industry spokesman and the author of three books, Taking Care of E-Business, Cyber Rules, and Virtual Selling. He is the founder, chairman, and CEO of C3, an energy and emissions management company. He's also chairman of the First Virtual Group, a holding company with interests in real estate, agribusiness, global investment management, and philanthropy. In the early 1990s, Tom pioneered the development of Customer Relationship Management, or CRM, by using computer software in really very revolutionary ways to streamline sales and customer service. As CEO of Siebel Systems, which he founded in 1993, Tom presided over one of the fastest growing and most consistently profitable companies in the IT sector. The firm's CRM software and related marketing strategy spawned an entire industry, earning Tom uh, recognition as a visionary entrepreneur. Siebel Systems merged with Oracle in early 2006. Tom and his wife, Stacy, a Cal alumna, established a foundation in 1996 to support education and energy solutions and to fight homelessness and drug abuse. In addition, the Siebel Scholars Foundation endows scholarships for graduate studies in computer science, business, and bioengineering at 18 leading universities, including, I'm very proud to say, Berkeley, Berkeley Engineering. In fact, eight... <laughs> Berkeley first, huh? So, <laughs> uh, in fact, eight Siebel scholars are graduating from Berkeley this year in bioengineering and computer science. Tom has been a leading advocate and advisor here at Berkeley. He has helped to shape the direction of several major campus initiatives, from stem cell research to graduate education to big data. I'm also grateful for the strategic guidance he provides us as a pivotal member of our College of Engineering Advisory Board. Before we begin the lecture, I'd like to invite Chancellor Nicholas Dirks to the stage. Please, Chancellor Dirks. Thank you, uh, Shankar. Forgive me, I'll just drop my mic. Uh, it's uh, wonderful to be here on this occasion, uh, the first view from the top lecture this spring, uh, and to see uh, Tom again and now uh, be here to, uh, uh, to listen to you. Um, this is a great occasion for all kinds of reasons, but I just want to reiterate that as Berkeley engineers, all of you, and as Berkeley engineers, 
all of you, all of us play key roles in upholding Berkeley's reputation for innovation and service to society. So I'm uh, delighted to be here and be part of this. But I'd like now, if I could, to invite Tom to the stage before he gives his talk, just to present him with a small something. <laughs> Tom? I'm going to read out the Chancellor's citation. On rare occasions, the Berkeley campus bestows a special honor, the Chancellor's citation, to distinguish visitors to recognize their achievements as global citizens. It is my great privilege to salute Thomas M. Siebel with this high honor. I will now read from the citation. The Chancellor of the University of California, Berkeley, honors Thomas M. Siebel in recognition of the vision and leadership he has given to the cause of realizing a world where everyone has the means to dream, invent, and build. Through the Thomas and Stacy Siebel Foundation, Mr. Siebel has worked in close partnership with the university to reward individual initiative and advance collective discovery. The Siebel Stem Cell Institute harnesses the tremendous potential of regenerative medicine to address intractable diseases and confront the challenges of aging. The Siebel Scholars Program recognizes graduate students who offer the greatest promise as innovators and leaders. Mr. Siebel has also helped to secure the university's academic preeminence through the endowment of two faculty chairs. Thomas Siebel's generosity and guidance have greatly enhanced our university and the world at large. We are honored by the trust he has placed in us, and we are driven to move forward to fulfill a shared vision of achievement and social betterment. Please join me in a round of applause. Congratulations. Chancellor, uh, Dean Sastry, thank you for the kind words and the great honor. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, it's my great honor to have the opportunity to talk with you today. And I'm going to uh, share with you some thoughts about the business formation process. This will be my fourth decade in the information and technology industry. And I have been... Um, Fortunate to be in the right place at the right time on multiple occasions and, uh, and, and managed to not completely follow up the opportunity. And there's more to that than you might think. Okay, but I'm going to talk to you about uh, my experience in business ideation, in business formation, and talk to you about how these things happen and where they go and how you know, we thought about it. Uh, in the hope that some of this might be relevant to you as you go off and and change the world, which you will change. I mean, you're, you're, you're living here as part of a miracle at the University of California at Berkeley, and you are, you've, you need to count yourself amongst the luckiest people on the planet. And you know, your job is to go forth and change the world, you know, to to invent and to make the world a better place and to make it a healthier place and to make the quality of life better and to bring peace, uh, that's the job that you're going to leave here with. So it's, uh, you know, start thinking about that and uh, <laughs> you know, get your mind around that because that's the responsibility that you have. Now, I was a uh, graduate student, uh, so I'm going to give you a little bit about my background and how I got here just on, on, on the business side, okay? I'm not going to talk about the philanthropic side, but we've done some, I think, unusual things. Um, and I was, I studied first history of science at the University of Illinois, and then I was getting uh, a graduate degree in business later on after I went out of the world because I wanted to learn the languages of business so that I could, you know, participate in that activity. And, uh, and uh, in the course of, I was involved in the business school and I started to take some uh, OR classes over in the 
at north of Green Street at uh, University of Illinois in Urbana. That would be the engineering campus in the uh, School of Industrial Engineering. And we were doing discrete event simulation. And back then, we were doing you know programming on with Hollerith cards, at Fortran, on these big CDC mainframe computers. And um, yeah, I found that fascinating. And I remember one day yeah, running across a book. This would have been now 1979, 1980, at the University of Illinois Bookstore in the, in the, in the uh, Student Union by a guy by the name of Daniel Bell, who was a sociologist at Harvard. And uh, <clears throat> Bell uh, came up with this idea. This is written in the 70s, now late 70s, okay? So this is before anything that you know. I mean, this is before the internet, as you know, think about it. This is before, this is before wireless. This is before, um, uh, this is before, uh, come on, what did Bob Metcalf at 3Com do with the uh, uh, ethernet? Um, this is before all of these things, okay? And uh, Bell, who was actually, a, uh, I later learned, a pretty famous sociologist but, um, and, uh, and a Marxist, um, theorized that there was a fundamental change going on in the structure of the global economy. Okay, and he put forth this idea going from you know agrarian agrarian economies to pre-industrial economies to the industrial revolution, which led to industrial economies. And he talked about you know resources and the role of labor. Okay, and he theorized before all the technologies that we know of today that we were entering an era that we we're moving from primarily a you know first we had economies that were extractive in nature. Okay, and then we had these labor-based economies that were kind of production-based. And he saw the world changing from one where we were focused on an uh, uh, economy that was focused on production to one that was really focused on intellectual property. And uh, he coined the term the post-industrial society and coined the term of the information age. And he predicted that we're entering a world where information technology and the timeliness and availability of data would change everything about the way that we work, the way that we communicate, the way that we entertain ourselves. And um, it was really quite an inspiring idea. And so I thought, you know, this is, in, you know, I bought it, hook, line, and sinker. And, uh, and so I said, you know, this is a game I want to play. So I managed to get myself admitted into the engineering school at the University of Illinois, for which I was completely unqualified. <laughs> and uh, okay. and uh, I mean, I can remember I hadn't even taken physics. Like, I hadn't even taken calculus. I can remember reading the, you know, when you know, I, had to, I had to read the physics textbook, which was the prerequisite for the class while I was taking the class. So I was, I was completely unqualified, so I don't know why they let me in. But... Um, it, uh, I studied relational database theory. And uh, so this is now, we're in early 80s, and a guy named Ted Codd had recently published a paper out of Santa Teresa Labs, uh, at, uh, which is not too far from here. He was with IBM. And he proposed the application of set theory uh, to the problem of data storage and retrieval, which is fundamentally what the, the concept of a relational database. And he proposed a language for that, which was called SQL, with which many of you will be familiar. And uh, you know, this struck me as a fundamentally, you know, important idea that you, that would have you know significant economic impact. And so that was the area that I focused upon. And I did my graduate work in relation to database theory, specifically focusing on uh, concurrency control algorithms in relational database systems. And then one day. When I was getting ready to graduate, uh, back then we used to have, I don't know, they still have these little mail slots in the graduate offices. And there was a mail slip there from a company called Oracle. And they wanted me to give them a call. Well, nobody had ever heard of Oracle. I mean, Oracle had 40 people. And uh, you know, the worldwide market for relational database at this time might have been like $5 million. And I had been talking with the people who were important in relational database. The people who were important and where I've been interviewing was like, believe it or not, Sperry. And it's probably a couple you don't even remember. 
and they had a product called Mapper, and then IBM was talking about the productization of System R. And then uh, one thing led to another, and I came out to Silicon Valley and interviewed with a guy named Bob Miner and Larry Ellison, who were thinking about this idea. Of, uh, and their offices were at 2710 Sand Hill Road. They had about 10,000 square feet, and they were just getting started. And uh, they were getting ready to ship a product called Oracle version 2, and the reason that they were shipping Oracle version 2 is they didn't believe that anybody would buy or anything was version 1. <laughs> and that the thing that, yeah, there never was a version 1. Uh, and, uh, so I threw my hat in with those guys, and uh, it turned out to be a pretty good decision. And, and so originally I was involved in, in the Middle West in explaining in a you know, technical support role and explaining you know, how this technology might be applied to business problems and then I went out to Washington, D.C. And, um, and developed and got involved in sales and, and again, committed my sales territory. It was half the federal government, 10 states and half the federal government. Today, that's probably, you know, 15,000 people fulfilling that role. Okay. And then later came back, to, moved out to California in 1995, ran product marketing, product-like marketing, took the technology into the IBM mainframe space. Because back then, all this, this is kind of the advent of the mini computer now. If we think about 1983, 84, 85, it's all about vaxes. And, uh, and so we moved the technology upwards into the IBM mainframe space, NVM and MVS, and then down into Unix, and then ultimately personal computers. And I kind of drove that process. And then ultimately, so I ran product marketing and then product line marketing and then ultimately ran sales and marketing worldwide. And I was there for about 10 years and it was the learning experience of a lifetime. And, um, you know, when you, you know, we were making it up in real time. I mean, nobody knew any what intellectual property was. Nobody knew what software was. Nobody knew about software revenue recognition. It was, it was all being made up in real time. It was fascinatingly exciting. Um, <clears throat> And uh, in the course of this, uh, I developed a system at Oracle that allowed them to basically track everything they knew about their customers, everything they knew about their, their products, okay, everything they knew about pricing, everything they knew about customer service. It was a system called OASIS, Oracle Automated Sales Information System. It was about the application of, of basically relational database technology and communication technology to the problems of sales, marketing, and customer service. And there was a lot of interest in that from other companies, from companies like IBM and uh, Octel and uh, business, um, and many other companies would come by and visit. And so I went to Larry and I said, Larry was then moving into the application software business, and I said, Larry, I think there's a market for this, and I think we should come up with a commercial implementation of this technology and take it to market. And he had no interest. So I said, okay, bye, I'll see you later. And uh, it, it, I mean, it was, it, was, it, was a, it was a good learning experience, but this is something I really wanted to do. Now, the way things happen, and so, you know, and so then we took Oracle from, like, I was there from, like, day one to, to the point where it was about a billion-dollar business. And so it was a business about being, you know, so why, where was I? At the right place at the right time. I managed not to fall, completely follow up the opportunity. Okay, and then I got involved in, um, I left to, to start Siebel Systems. But the way things happen is sometimes you get sidetracked. And I got recruited to be the company, the CEO of a company called Gain Technology in 1990. 1990. And uh, back then, what we were thinking about was, okay, what we built at Gain was we built the first multi-user system that allowed people to build multi-user applications that incorporated sound, motion, video, graphics, text, and hypertext. Today, you all live in that world every day, but I can tell you, in 1990, there was nothing there. So we developed this technology. It turned out to be a pretty good idea. It was a lot of fun. Our largest customers were Japanese customers, employee-owned company, profitable company, and then we traded that company, we sold that company to Sybase in 1992, which let me free to go do what I really wanted to do was for this company. Okay, so if we look at the information technology business in 1993, when we started this in July of 1993, 
you know, I fundamentally believed that the world was going to be changed by the application of information technology and communication technology. And as of 1993, we had applied these technologies successfully to most business processes, general office automation work, human resources, computer-aided manufacturing, accounting. So the idea of closing the books of a company like AT&T or an IBM without, without a you know, computer-based accounting system as in 1993 would have been absurd. You couldn't do it. The idea of running a General Motors or a Nissan without computer-aided manufacturing would have been impossible. Okay, and yet the business processes of sales, marketing, and customer service remained largely untouched by information technology as of 1993. I mean, the state of the art was kind of the yellow sticky or the note on the back of the business card. And we thought it was highly unlikely that these business processes would remain untouched. And so we thought, let's put together some people who, with some experience, and uh, we developed this market. Turned out to be a pretty good idea. Okay, so what, what happened then? So let's think about, let's think back to 1993, 94, 95, what was going on? Big step function of technology to just come online. Okay, Windows 95, how important was that? Hugely important. I mean, you, you, most of you can't remember the day okay, when, when there was not graphical user interfaces. Well, I assure you, there was such a day, and it wasn't that long ago. Okay? <laughs> okay. And so the, 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 idea of, the idea of a graphical user interface was, it was huge. Okay, so, um, what recently... What had just become available was form, small form factor nomadic computing devices, broad bandwidth communications, high-speed relational database systems. Okay? So we took those technologies and basically applied those technologies uh, to the problem of sales marketing and customer service. So this is like sales automation, internet self-service, field service, uh, 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 call center systems, um, uh, marketing automation, marketing analytics this is the space that we focused uh, um, this energy. And we, there was a, one hard problem we had to solve. Okay, and that was the problem of data synchronization, of replic da the, basically the synchronization of data that was partitioned into non disjoint subsets on intermittently connected nomadic devices. It was actually a pretty interesting technical problem. Okay, but I had thought about that a little bit at, at the university, and I got some other people who thought about that, and we, 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 we solved that problem, which was a, actually, that was kind of a hard one. Well, this, it, this turned out to be a pretty good idea. And so fast forward six years, Siebel Systems became the fastest growing software company in history, and by 1999, it has 8,000 employees in 29 countries, 4,000 customers in 29 countries, and we're doing about $2 billion in business a year. Market valuation of $53 billion. Okay, consistently cash positive, profitable business. It was the experience of a lifetime. And now, when you think about businesses, okay, and, and, okay you, you, you know, you, you're, you know, you're always kind of thinking about kind of what are the constraints on growth, okay, but, you, but you, you're thinking about customer satisfaction, you're thinking about technology. Okay, but in, in, in technology markets, in software markets, you want to think about market share. Okay, the, the way that software markets tend to develop outside of the operating system market is the leader will get 50% share. Number two will get 15% share. Number three will get 10% share. After that, it'll get, they'll get a fractional share. Okay, when the market is expanding the way that markets do, like the market is just explosively expanding right now, okay, lots of companies can appear to be successful. Okay, now let me help you out. Okay, it used to be about every 12, 15 years. Now it happens a little faster, more frequently than that. The music does stop. Okay, okay, and when the music stops, it's basically. The, only the market leader can continue to generate cash. So the game you want to play in an expansive market is market share. So we, uh, this was, so <clears throat> Siebel Systems had greater than 50% market share in every market that we're in. in. In call center, sales automation, field service, internet service, marketing analytics. Some of these products are still pretty popular today. Like uh, marketing analytics, this is called uh, OBI, Oracle Business Intelligence. I mean, it's, it's a huge product. Um, we had greater than 50% share in every vertical market 
in every country in the world. So we were larger than the sum of all competitors combined. Uh, Larry Ellison, who was committed to crush us, and he got a little emotional about this, and he had, he had 3,000 people, 3,000 people on the CRM project for 10 years. Okay, and for that he got less than 1% market share. Um, so you want to think about market share, okay? Now let's talk about let's talk about business formation, okay? Let's talk about being in the information technology business, okay? It's not a technology game, okay? It is a human capital game, okay? It is it is your team against their team, okay? And and the and the reason that we dominated the market at Siebel is honestly our people were just better, more experienced, more talented. Okay, this was like you know putting the this, the, this was like you know putting the uh, you know the front line of the New York Patriots, you know uh, New England Patriots against you know uh, some Sandlot team. It was not a fair fight. You do not want to engage in fair fights. Um, <laughs> um, it became apparent to me. After and, and by the way, Siebel, even from like you know after 9/11, when the whole market went to hell, from you know 2001, 2002, 2003, in that period of time when thousands and thousands of companies were closing the doors, I think Siebel generated like two billion dollars in free cash flow. So this thesis played out of this market share game. It became apparent uh, that that um, to me about. 2003, 4, 5, that this idea of standalone companies uh, in application software was not what the market was looking for. The market was looking for combined suites. And so when Larry called and said, gee, I want to talk to you about, I remember him calling and I said, uh, and I hadn't talked to Larry for some years other than reading about him, like bashing me in the media. And I said, well, Larry, I... I I say, I said, I assume you're not calling, uh, looking for sponsorship for America's Cup boat. <laughs> and he said, well, it's not a bad idea, but we'd have to put the names in alphabetical order. And uh, anyhow, one thing led to another, and we sold Siebel to Oracle. It was a very successful business combination. So now it's January 2006. We're in the Bush administration, okay, and we're going to war. Okay, and we're going to war. I couldn't figure out what we're going to war about. Okay, I mean we're going to war, and we're occupying oil fields. And if there's any energy policy that made any sense at all that was that, that was going on in the United States, I couldn't figure it out. I was completely baffled by it. I didn't know anything about it. I had a little time on my hands, and um, so I went to some places where I had some affiliation uh, to learn what I could about energy and about the geopolitics of energy, about, you know, about the physics of energy, about back then people used to talk about peak oil, something people don't, don't talk about very much anymore. There's all these discussions of climate change. Of, um, and so I spent a bunch of time at Princeton with a guy named Steve Pakala. Uh, came out and spent time at, uh, here at, well, I spent a lot of time at the University of Illinois. I spent a lot of time here at... Uh, UC Berkeley with Shanker and Paul and Costas, we talked about it, and a lot of time at Stanford. And we have an organization, and so just trying to understand what this was all about. And then we held some conferences. We hosted a, are there any Siebel scholars in the room? No? Well, Siebel scholars, there's about 800 Siebel scholars in the world. They're pretty bright people. You know, each of them would have been like one of the top five people in their graduating class at you know, pretty good schools like the Computer Science School at Berkeley, and you know the Bioengineering School at Johns Hopkins, and the, and the uh, Business School at Harvard. So, pretty good schools. And uh, there's like 800 Siebel scholars in the world. We get together for conferences every year, and uh, uh, Chancellor Bergino was kind enough to host a conference here on energy in 2000 climate in 2007, and. Um, we had two or three hundred people here, and we had, you know, Secretary of Energy and the Director of the EPA, and we had people from the Reagan Enterprise Institute and Cato, and you know, we had, you know, we had, you know, everything from the Sierra Club to, you know, the Tea Party, 
you know, kind of politically and intellectually. It was a fascinating dialogue that took place over, over uh, two or three days. And then in 2008, we held a conference at Water at Northwestern with experts on water. And we had about two or three hundred people, three or three hundred people there. And then in 2009, uh, Susan Hockfield, who was the chancellor president of MIT, hosted a conference at Energy at, M at MIT. And we had uh, Steve Bacala from Princeton there, Tom Friedman from the New York Times, uh, I think SD from Harvard, and we talked about energy. And then, uh, and so we're starting to learn the language. You know, by this, so this, you know, they were now into it from say 2006, seven, eight, nine, we're starting to learn the language. And then in 2000, so this is, this C3 Energy is the company I'm currently involved in. This is, you know, potentially being in the right place in the right time the fourth time. And uh, what, we, what I did here is I invited about 50 people from around the world to come out to California and talk about information technology, communication technology, energy, and energy policy, and climate. And some of these people would have included the energy team from McKinsey and Company, um, my, Steve Ward, who was the CIO at IBM and had been my largest customer at Siebel. We had a Steve, we had like a billion dollar CRM implementation at IBM. Sean Coyne, former customer when he was the CIO at GE Power, now GE Energy, and also the CIO at Toyota. Uh, we had uh, Ed Abbo come, Ed is a, was, ran all application software at Oracle. And a bunch of people who really, uh, you know, from Juniper and McKinsey, uh, the energy team from McKinsey and Company, Oracle, SAP. And we met in the spring, summer, and fall of 2008 in Woodside and just kind of wrestled and brainstormed and, and thought about, you know, gee, you know, what are, you know, what does the company of the future look like? What do partner ecosystems look like? What are what's going on that's interesting in technology trends? You know, was there an opportunity to make a, a contribution to the dialogue? And so after people worked on this for seven, eight, nine months, the decision was made in December of 2008 to basically start this company. I'm going to tell you what it was about. It was called C3 Energy. And so I, the decision was made in December. I sent out an email on Friday. We raised $20 million by Sunday, and the company was started. Um, the, you know, the next step was, and, but the idea was, you know, I wasn't going to run it, so we had, uh, you know, put together you know, a partner ecosystem and a board of directors, and let me kind of go forward, and we decided to, you know, this was the value chain that we wanted to address, the value chain associated with power, um, generation, transmission, distribution through the customer. And uh, we went out and interviewed, you know, really hundreds of companies to find out what they were thinking about, what were their issues, GDF Suez, PG&E, General Electric, Dow Chemical, Department of the Army. And we got to put together a, a very rich network, uh, a brain trust, to be able to communicate about this. Now, why was I able to do this? Because I'd been working with all these people for three decades, okay, in one capacity or another. I mean, so one of the decisions that you're going to have to make is are you going to run out of here and start a company or are you going to go to work someplace else? No, and I think it's an important decision. You know, so Peter Thiel would be here, you know, at one stage. I mean, he'd be giving you, you know, I think 100,000 bucks or something to quit school now and go start a company, okay? This is crazy. <laughs> How is this crazy talk? This guy's like a psychopath. Um, so I just want to tell you my experience, okay? Now, you know, and I'm going to talk about, you know, I was some combination between, you know, like consistently lucky and maybe a little bit good at this, okay? And, you know, I, if I had left the University of Illinois and went to try to start a company, nothing would have happened. I mean, I went to work, with, went to a place to work at Oracle. I had watched how these people do it. Okay, made every mistake that could be made. Okay, watched Larry Ellison make every mistake that could be made. Okay, learned a lot about, learned a lot. Do I think Larry's a talented guy? Larry's a gifted guy, don't get me wrong. I mean, he's, a, he's, a, he's gifted, okay? 
But, you know, I, what I learned at Oracle was, you know, how not to run a company. <laughs> and when I left to do, do it on my own, I said, I'm going to do exactly the opposite of what they do. And that, but that was a great learning experience. And, you know, you know I know that your, you know, your engineering deans, you know, and, and chancellors and presidents at the Princeton's and Stanford's and, and Berkeley's of the world are, you know, kind of really excited about this idea of like running, run on, you know, leave school and go start a company tomorrow. I wouldn't do that. I mean, I'd go learn something. Uh, it's, you know, in a, you know, screaming bull market, okay, which is what you have in February of 2014, it looks easy. Okay, let me help you out. There is nothing easy about it. Okay, it's just hard work and discouragement and, 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 and dealing with failure. In hindsight, you know, when you grew the fastest growing software company in history, it looks like it was all easy. Well, I tell you, it wasn't easy. So we decided to address this value chain. And what this was about, so we look, now it's 2013. No, it isn't 2013. It's uh, 2009. Okay, and what are, what are the technologies that are coming available that are kind of coming on big data, machine learning, analytics, social computer interaction models? So we want to apply those data, those, those technologies to the value chain. So that's what this C3 story is, which I'm going to go through in like five minutes. But just like at Siebel, we apply the, the step function of technologies that have become available to the business processes of sales, marketing, and customer service. We're applying at C3 these sciences to this value chain. Okay, so if you look at this value chain, okay, it's now being upgraded. This grid is being built out, is built out of like 19th and early 20th century technology. Some of it's even older than that, like, you know, porcelain. When's that, like 15th century or something? <laughs> and, um, but it's being, it, it, in the way that, you know, fundamentally the way that it works is, you know, when the lights go out in Berkeley, you call P, well, you have your own power. So does, like when the lights go out in Walnut Creek, uh, they, somebody calls PG&E, says our lights are out, and somebody drives around in trucks and climbs telephone poles, goes down manhole covers with voltmeters to identify boxes that aren't conducting electricity, and then you keep doing box swaps until the lights go back on. That's how the system works. Okay, now, this is being upgraded in a way to make all of these devices remotely machine addressable. This is this thing called the smart grid. The investment that's going on in the smart grid this decade worldwide is $2 trillion. So this is no small, $2 trillion, this is like significantly non-zero, okay? <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> and I assure you, if you look at the internet about the time that you know, Mark Andreessen would have spun out of the University of Illinois, this would be like 1995, okay? Nobody was thinking about spending $2 trillion on the internet, okay? So this is a, roughly the scale of this opportunity. And what we've, what we've done is, so I went around, so I said, human capital game. Okay, who, how can I find you know, the best people in the world to help lead this company? Well, the top of that list would be Shanker Sastry. So you get in your car, you drive across the bridge, you go, hey, Shanker, can I get you involved? And after Shanker, you drive back across the bridge and you go visit Condi. And you say, Condi, what do you think? And so Mayo Shattuck, chairman of Exelon, Steve Ward, CEO of IBM, Rick Levin, President of Yale, Spence Abraham, Secretary of Energy, okay, it's a human capital game. Same thing on the management team. All of these people have, you know, a Super Bowl ring. Okay, you know, ran all energy policy in the White House. Uh, ran all application, you know, aerospace engineer, uh, Princeton, mechanical engineering, MIT, ran all application software at Oracle, smart guy. I mean, all these people. Uh, and so the key to the game is my, see, this is going to be a little harder for you, okay, okay, than, than, than it is for me, but, okay, than it was for me in my career, but at all these companies, the key to the game is surround yourself with people who are better than you are. Again, easier for me than it will be for you, but I would, I would, I would strongly recommend that. Okay, so what we do, so if you look at what's going on in this value chain, of, so this value chain of, the grid that generates about, used to deliver, say, 22 billion gigawatts of energy around the world a year. And, you know, this is how it works, through transmission, distribution, generation. So you, you, somehow you're boiling water, 
okay? And you know, you're, you know, and you're either raising the temperature of the planet or not as you boil the water, okay? And then you generate electricity, you transmit it, you distribute it, you get it to a meter, and then you deal with energy efficiency. And below, underneath these systems are you know, all of these information systems associated with meter data management, customer billing, outage management, uh, voltage regulation, you know, hundreds of systems. So what we did is we developed a technology where we can basically take the union of the, and for all the obvious reasons that you'll learn someday, none of these systems can talk to one another, okay? And uh, so what we do is we built, we spent the last five years in about $150 million building a technology foundation that allows us to go into a grid operator like an Exelon, a PG&E, an NL in Europe, GDF Suez, and take the union of these data and aggregate them into a normalized, federated cloud image. And some of these images are pretty good. They're very substantial. This might be a 100, 200 terabyte cloud image. And uh, we, re we load these data at the rate of 6.5 billion transactions an hour okay, into this normalized image. And then we build kind of a nuclear reactor level analytics engine okay, that allows us to perform machine learning and do analytics on all of these data and then we manifest these insights in a series of applications that have very, very substantial economic, social, and environmental benefit. Okay, this would be, you know, it's these applications are like energy efficiency applications, demand response applications, um, AMI operations. This manages the infrastructures associated with smart grid, revenue protection, identifies theft, system asset risk, outage analytics and prediction, voltage optimization, and you know, the economic benefit of, so this is the stack that we bring to market. The economic benefit of the stack is like $300 per meter per year. Well, if you have like 8 million meters like Exelon does, again, this is like significantly non-zero. It's a lot of dough. Uh, we're blowing these two applications right now at Exelon. The economic benefit is $383 million a year. The whole stack at Exelon is $2.7 billion a year in recurring economic benefit. Now, I've been in the information technology business for a while, and I've been in some pretty interesting conversations, and I've been in a lot of boardrooms, okay? I can't say that I've been in that many meetings where I was talking to, you know, where I was talking to the board about, you know, $2.7 billion in recurring economic benefit a year. So it's a pretty fun conversation to have. And uh, so the impact of what, what is this is all about? It increases grid reliability, increases safety, lowers the cost of producing energy, increases reliability, reduces penetration to, to basically, uh, uh, reduces risk of penetration, and uh, reduces the greenhouse gas footprint of the value chain by 50%. So it's, you know, it's kind of, you know, better than distributing cigarettes. Okay? And very interesting problems that we're working on. This is where we're doing this, this, this today, some at very large scale, Exelon, Baltimore Gas and Electric, GDF Suez, GD, so huge implementations. Um, GDF Suez is probably a 200 terabyte cloud image. Um, the problems that we're dealing with are you know, fascinating in terms of the sizes of the data sets, the issues associated with machine learning, the social heat computer interfaces, and just kind of so this market. It's also nice to be, if you, to be in a growing market. Okay, it makes it a little easier. This is a billion and a half dollar software market in 2013, growing at a 24% compound annual growth rate. So it's a $5 billion market in 2017. And we're going to see if we can establish and maintain a leadership position in the space. What does that imply? 50% share. So this is just, you know, these are the types of applications we build in customer experience, energy efficiency. Um, it's. Um, really, you know, it's just kind of the experience of a lifetime. And so the, the you know, I'd go to work with some smart people if I were leaving school. I would go learn some things. I would surround myself with people with, who are smarter than, than I was. Okay? I would go find an opportunity. I would go find something where you're solving a meaningful economic problem. Okay? Honestly, I don't know how people get that much satisfaction about figuring out how to post selfies on the web. Okay? I, mean, I, couldn't, I, mean, I couldn't get up in the morning and do that. Uh, 
you know, when you're in the right place at the right time, when you flip, the, you'll, you'll be there and you'll know it and you'll flip the coin, you'll flip the coin 25 times in a row and it keeps coming up ahead. Just, you know, don't blow it. You know, don't do anything. Just, you know, so <laughs> just be careful because that moment will come and when it does, recognize it and don't change anything. Just keep doing exactly what you're doing. So... I think we have a, a few minutes for questions, and I'll be happy to uh, to, to, to field them. Thank you, uh, Tom, and thank you for agreeing to take some questions. Uh, you know, I'll be giving preference to students, so let's see, and. Uh, Staff of microphones, please uh, identify yourselves. Uh, major, you're in school. Or just yell. You don't need a microphone. We'll be able to hear you. <laughs> Ray, raise your hand. No questions? I'm going to get up real easy. <laughs> there we go. Uh, so, so you mentioned... Um, oh, sorry, could you, could we could say uh, what your name is. Sure. And My name is Rishi here? Chopra. I'm uh, an alumnus from the college as well. Um, you mentioned about uh, working at Oracle and said that it was kind of a way to learn how not to run a company. Uh, I remember hearing many stories about personal conflicts at Oracle because all of the senior management went on to go and found other successful companies. Would you say that that, uh, that aspect has been, uh, say, over-articulated by the media, this thing about... Um, Nobody getting along with Larry Ellison, and uh, you, you hear this again with Twitter, and oh, the Twitter co-founders can't get along. Is that something that's significant in your opinion to a this business? This is being broadcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, being recorded. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, Larry Ellison is a very talented guy. He really is, and I mean, he, I mean, he's gifted, and you know, his you know, he's got a unique management style, and it works for him. But I mean, look at the guy's record. I mean, the guy's changed the world. And, uh, you know, I don't know, in the period of time that I was there during the first decade, I'd say people weren't leaving to want to start other companies. Um, and, you know, it was, it was not the easiest place to work. I mean, you had to, you had to really want to work and really push yourself pretty hard to, to be successful there. But, man, Larry, is a, he's a very talented guy. Yes, sir, right in the middle. We can hear you. Actually, yeah, you know, I'd, uh, we, we need to record this. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I've been overruled. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Drew. I'm a mechanical engineering PhD student. And I had a question, actually, about the, um, the little company you mentioned in between uh, Oracle and Civil Systems games. So, Game, yeah. Yeah, so specifically, that gap, that two-year gap, uh, really struck me because you said you had this great idea for this new startup. And then you waited two years, and then you implemented it, and it became this huge thing. Uh, and I was wondering if you had any thoughts about if something like that is possible n nowadays, taking, you know, having an idea and not acting on it for that period of time, or because it seems like nowadays, you know, you just, you have something and you immediately have to go for it. Um, do you think that's possible? I think it worked to my advantage. You know, actually, I couldn't get, didn't have, uh, I really didn't have any money to, like, finance the Siebel myself at that time. And I really couldn't find any funding for the idea. And so then, and, because it was a crazy idea and everybody knew it couldn't be done and there would never be a market for it because that's the way capital markets work. Okay, and um, so I would say it was very fortuitous actually that there was a, almost a three-year delay because that three-year delay allowed this big step function of technology to become available. Okay, and by the time I was done with GAIN, you know, I didn't need any external capital. And so, but it was, but it was very fortuitous because I think it, it, it what seemed what might have been discouraging, basically, you know, all these technologies that I talked about, broad bandwidth communications, portable computing, graphical user interfaces, weren't available in 1990, and they were available in 1993. And so I think in 1990, that project would have failed. Go ahead. Oh. And we'll get Hi, uh, my name is Wyatt uh, Leong. Uh, I'm an alumnus of uh, Berkeley, uh, uh, majoring in EECS, and I got my graduate degrees from Stanford. Um, so I really like what you said about being at the right place at the right time. And what I would like to ask you is perhaps you could uh, provide a little more uh, details into your decision making in your very first job after graduate school. You mentioned that. You know, you talk to uh, Oracle, which is an unknown startup, 
and you also talked to the leaders at that time uh, in relational data. You mentioned IBM, and I think also. So I have very strong thoughts about how to get a job out of college, and I think that the way that people do it is most of the way that people do it is go do interviews until somebody offers you a job, and then, ex then kind of compare the interviews and accept the one that's better, or compare the offers and accept the one that's better. Okay, I don't think that's the way to do it. Okay, I think the way that you do it. You know, this is, have you ever seen this book called "What Color Is Your My Parachute"? Okay, it's a great book. I mean, it's, a, it's, really, it's, it's been around for, you know, it's been a bestseller for like 27 years or something. This is a great book. Okay, but, I'm sorry? I think it's 40 years old. 40? I mean, it's been around for a while. I mean, it, this, is, this is like the joy of cooking. This is right up there, okay? <laughs> okay? And, and, and a list of great books, okay? You know, but basically what that book says is, okay, figure out what industry you're interested in working in, okay? Identify the company you want to work for, and then go get hired there. Okay, and, and don't worry about what the job is, what the salary is, what the position is, or what the title is. And, you know, write the CEO a letter and say, listen, this is who I am, this is where I come from, this is what I've done, and I want to work, with, I want a job at your company, and I'll take whatever job you give me. Okay, and then just make the rest of it happen. And, uh, but that's, that's kind of, you know, my recollection of uh, uh, the executive summary. Of that. But that's the way that I would do it. I'd find out where you want to go to work, and I'd go get hired there. Okay. <laughs> oh, sorry. Hi, Mr. Sebo. My name is Simon. I'm a graduating uh, uh, mechanical engineering student here at Berkeley. Uh, so my question is that, so when you don't have the experiences or like background to hire people with seasoned experience, uh, then like in your mind, uh, what's, uh, how to measure good human capital if you try to find people for your startup? You know? Well, the only way to know how, that I know how to do it is to like, you know, have worked with people in the trenches for about 10 years and know what they're capable of doing. And, uh, you know, and, you know, find people that you know what their work ethic is, you know what their capability is, you know what their problem solving ability is, and, and, and so that's how, that, that's how I did it. That's the only way I know how. Okay, thanks. Go ahead, go ahead. Um, my name is Chris. I'm a PhD student in mechanical engineering. Um, We've heard about all these amazing, successful companies, but um, are there other companies that you started along the way that failed, and um, when they failed, what kept you going? Um, I would say C3 failed. Okay, C3 failed, okay, when this company started. When I started it, okay, I was not the CEO, and it went for about two years. It was primarily focused at the clean tech market. Okay, in about 2009, you look this up on the internet, I got injured pretty badly, okay? I was, I was I believe it or not, I was attacked and mauled by an elephant. So I was like a mess, okay? And uh, for like two and a half years. So I was completely out of the picture. And they were, they were, they were focused at the clean tech market. And to the, you know, when natural gas, when very successful in the clean tech market, by the way, okay? When natural gas went from $16 a kilojoule down to two, the clean tech market disappeared. Okay, so just crumpled around it. That was a failing company that I went back in as CEO in July of 2011, okay, and found, a, you basically figured we did a complete pivot, and rather than do an enterprise at a time, at a house at a time, we basically decided to take energy efficiency on, like, the whole grid in one big bite, right? Okay, and it turned out to be a pretty, big, pretty good idea, okay? And so, uh, and, and so now it's a very rapidly growing uh, enterprise application software company, SaaS model, okay, and uh, it's growing very rapidly and it's very exciting. And if you know any like data scientists, okay, Lillian, okay, or you know any like people who like <laughs> machine learning or, you know, great programmers, you know, my email is tsebel at siebel.org. Don't send my way. Yeah, um, Mr. Sibyl, uh, my, my name is... Gotta keep your eye on the ball. I, 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 I almost forgot why I came here. So, sorry. <laughs> hey, uh, Mr. Sibyl, my name is Blake. Uh, I graduated from Cal last year. I uh, studied civil engineering. Uh, I work for Riviera. We help vc back startup to build an engineering team. C3 is actually yeah, my you, you guys have done work for us. You guys have done recruiting work for us, Riviera. Absolutely. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's yeah. good work for us. Oh, thanks. Uh, 
Yeah, so I guess, you know, I, I look for a lot of candidates for C3, C3 other than, you know, the uh, good school, relevant experience, you know, a passion for big data, machine learning, and SaaS product. Like, what's like a special quality C3 is looking for? People who want to work, people who like to work, people who want to solve difficult problems, people who like to be challenged, people who see the world that consists of glasses that are half full. That's what we're looking for. All right, thank you. Aru, last question. With degrees degree. from Berkeley or oh, MIT. Okay. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, okay. I thought I saw Aru up there. So. Okay, last question for you, Aru. I wanted to thank you for coming here. My name is Eldon. I'm a junior level EEC student. And I wanted to ask you because uh, there seems to be a trend in the startup community to release a prototype and then sort of iterate as the market um, gives it feedback. And when, when speaking about C3, it seems that you know, you bounced off these ideas with your network, and you had a fairly clear vision before entering the market. I was wondering if you could offer, um, you know, perhaps some experience or advice when it comes to refining a product or a business model before you bring it to market. Well, I, I would say, um, first of all, the, at Siebel, we built, I think, 400 products in 25 languages, okay? And at C3 Energy today, we have order of... 20 products, okay, that, that were out there in various stages of either production or development. And we absolutely get together with customers, prototype them, you know, install the prototype, release the prototype, test the prototype, iterate on it daily. This is how we do it, okay. And, uh, you know, there's no substitute for, you know, for, you know, thinking it out thoroughly. But, you know, we, we do it with a customer in the room. We do write specs, okay. There's this whole kind of, you know, this move towards agile computing, which is something I believe in. Okay, but agile computing is frequently used as just an excuse to engage in development in the absence of rigor. Okay, I don't recommend that. Okay, there's still a place for rigor in engineering. Okay, um, but uh, I think the idea of, you know, prototyping and iterative development is, is, is very powerful and it's the way you get things done. Rule, last question, make it good. Hi, my name is Rule. Uh, I'm a student in the control and dynamical systems here at, at X, and I want to prevent you from, uh, you know, drawing all, all these wonderful engineers to C3, although it's a, it's a great opportunity, uh, by raising an alternative. So I was wondering, I saw a, a, a fantastic idea to bring, back, bring together all this data, and I wondered how you're thinking of engaging with um, researchers at universities like Berkeley to, you know, get more, more intelligence and, and more opportunities out of this. Uh, this so we're data. very actively engaged with the research community, with, uh, with people at here at Berkeley, uh, with Shanker's group, with Costas, with Lillian, with Peter uh, Bolson. We're involved with Kerry uh, 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 Armel at Stanford, uh, Lynn Orr at Stanford. Uh, Zico Coulter at, at CMU, we're very actively involved with the academic world. And so that's, that's a core part of the strategy. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my great, great uh, pleasure and honor to be able to talk with you today. Thank you for the courtesy that you extended. <laughs>